early on in the movie Castaway, the main character, Chuck Noland, played by Tom Hanks, says, quote, Time rules over us without mercy. It's like a fire. It could either destroy us or keep us warm. End quote. One of the lines that gets repeated throughout the movie is that we live and we die by time. Time is a simple but interesting and effective theme to build a story around. And as you start peeling away the layers of it, it becomes both more complex and also something that most people can relate to. Some people might argue that the way to define history is entirely dependent on time. History is about the way things change and the way things stay the same. As time goes on, what are the variables that are changing? What are the constants that are withstanding that change? And what are the lessons that we can learn from it? But one of the great tricks of history, to me at least, is that even though time is always moving forward and things are changing, to us on a personal level, it doesn't always feel like the world around us is changing when we're living in it. But of course it does, and we can have these everyday experiences that become memorable. They're known as awe experiences where you sort of find yourself captured in a moment in time. Maybe you're feeling yourself rooted in time as everything else seems to be changing around you, or perhaps you feel yourself changing quickly as the world around you stays the same. Legendary humanistic psychologist Abraham Maslow talks about an experience he had like this where he was looking at the ocean. He says, quote, With surf, you sense a contrast between your own temporary nature and the surf's eternity. The fact that it will be there always, was there always, and that you are witnessing something that's a million years old and will be there a million years from now. I pass, and my own reaction to that is one of sadness on the one hand and of great appreciation on the other hand. It seems to me that the surf is more beautiful to me now than it used to be, and more touching. That would be perhaps an example of the simultaneous perception of the temporal and the eternal, which, in that sense of witnessing, is apocryphal. In thinking of the surf, I realize I am mortal, and the surf is not. This makes a strong contrast. End quote. As Maslow talks about being rooted on the sand there and contemplating the eternity of the ocean, you could certainly make a connection to a zoomed-out view of history and your own place in that equation as the wheels of history continue to turn and you realize you're just a small part of this big, amazing thing. But from a more zoomed-in perspective, as Chuck Nolan says in the movie, we live and we die by time. For Chuck, as he's stuck on the island, Chuck's previous experience of time, the past, is simultaneously the thing that is tethering him to life and keeping him going, but it's also the thing that he needs to drop if he's going to move on live, and really thrive. So I think Castaway is a movie about time. It's about the duality of letting go and remembering, the delicate balance that needs to be struck there to reach your full potential. It's about the unknown, exploring your own personal resiliency. It's about purpose, or as the Japanese might call it, ikigai. It has major connections to humanistic and positive psychology, transcending your circumstances in order to become the best version of yourself. And maybe at a more simple level, it's just about starting over. And when it comes time to do that, recognizing what's changed 
and what stayed the same. The opening shot of Castaway shows a crossroads. I think it's somewhere in the middle of Texas. And of course, the confusion of starting over and perhaps not knowing where to go is a big theme of the movie. And Chuck Nolan will end up at that very crossroads at the end of the movie. So there's some nice circularity to it. And from there, we meet Bettina, who is a artistic, creative worker of some type. And we learn that her packages that she sends out and many things on her property have these angel wings on them, which of course are going to be symbolic for Chuck later on. We learn that Bettina is married to Dick, who turns out to be aptly named as we shortly find out that he's cheating on her. So on the first viewing of the movie, this whole Bettina and Dick thing might just seem like it's a opportunity to introduce the FedEx package delivery system and introduce us to Chuck. But on second or third viewings, you realize that Bettina is actually a central character to this story. At any rate, we're introduced to Chuck, who of course is played by Tom Hanks. And he seems like a bit of a obnoxious gentleman. He seems like he's obsessed with work. We see him yelling at employees. He's obsessed with time and delivering packages on time. There's the story where his co-workers are making fun of him because he stole a kid's bike in order to deliver a package on time. I guess he's a bit of a stereotypical mailroom manager, FedEx manager type of guy. He's got lots of pagers. He's checking his watch all the time. He's all about calendars and instead of spending quality time with his girlfriend, Kelly, he has to schedule that quality time so that it fits in with the rest of his work needs. From the perspective of humanistic psychology, Scott Barry Kaufman identifies two types of needs that human beings have. The first are deficiency needs, and these are things that human beings might need or might think they need, but don't necessarily allow them to thrive and grow. They are simply mere survival needs. And on the other hand, there's being needs, which humanistic psychologist Scott Barry Kaufman identifies as more of the needs that you need in order to feel fulfilled and to allow for growth and to reach your full potential. These would be things more along the lines of love and connection and exploration, purpose. So from that perspective, you might say that Chuck, early on in the movie, is much more focused on those deficiency needs. The money, the work, the order, and the structure that time and watches and calendars can provide. And perhaps he's leaving his being needs unattended. Maybe he's leaving Kelly unattended, his girlfriend played by Helen Hunt, or maybe he's leaving his friend Stan unattended. There's a conversation that Chuck listens in on between his friend Stan and the flight attendant on one of these trips that they take around the world with FedEx, and Stan talks about his wife being sick and things not looking good for her, and you can kind of just see the look on Chuck's face that... Maybe he's starting to think about this stuff and how he might have been not exactly the best friend and he probably is thinking about his relationship with Kelly and how he could improve there. And Chuck makes this sort of half-baked effort to help Stan at the last minute by offering to hook him up with this doctor that he knows from far away and it just seems like a last minute thing that there wasn't a lot of thought put into when his friend probably needs something more comforting than that. So rather than living a life in that style of comforting and fulfilling those being needs, 
appreciating Kelly and appreciating Stan and his friendship, Chuck seems to be stuck in that deficiency need area. He's not really taking the time to appreciate the everyday things and the extraordinary things that make up the ordinary day-to-day life. There's a nice little throwback to this idea later in the movie when Chuck discovers the dead pilot or the dead flight attendant, I'm not sure which it was, but he realizes he had been calling Albert Allen his whole life. So as he's burying this guy on the island and looking through his wallet and his possessions and the pictures that this guy has with his family, he's realizing this guy was presumably close to him on many of these trips. And yes, it was for work, but Chuck couldn't even take the time to learn this guy's name. He's checking his watch and his beeper at Christmas dinner. He's trying to squeeze in a last second goodbye in the car with Kelly. And yes, he's planning to propose, but you do get the feeling, just like with the fact that he couldn't remember the guy's name, or with the way he's kind of casual about his friendship with Stan and the needs that Stan probably had, you get the feeling that maybe his obsession with time and his obsession with work and order could be impacting his potential relationship with Kelly. Now, from here in the movie, of course, we get the plane crash scene, which, in my opinion, holds up pretty well 20 years later from a special effects and sound and drama perspective. But anyways, he's now on the island, stuck on this deserted island with nobody there to help him or assist him or save him. And one of the first things he notices is that the locket, the watch that Chuck keeps in his pocket that Kelly gave him, doesn't work anymore. So this theme of time is continuing here where the outside world is going to be continuing to change and move on, but Chuck is stuck on the island. Time is standing still. And that idea is symbolized by the locket no longer working. The first couple of scenes when Chuck is stranded on the island are some of the most fun in the movie because he really struggles here. He's taking stock of what he has, but he also has to try to figure out how to live on this island, and it's really a disaster from the get-go. He doesn't know how to fish, he doesn't know how to make fire, he's struggling to open up a coconut, and he really just can't seem to do anything right. Now, from the perspective of humanistic psychology, like we've been talking about the last two episodes of the podcast, there is this hierarchy of needs that often gets attributed to Maslow. And Scott Barry Kaufman came along recently updating that hierarchy with his sailboat metaphor that I think fits nicely into Castaway and eventually the raft that Chuck will create to get off the island. But I think you can look at this movie from that perspective. When Chuck gets on the island, he has to start with those basic security needs, which are safety, connection, and self-esteem. So from the safety perspective, he's trying to make fire, and he's trying to figure out how to eat, and he's looking for shelter, and he's licking up water in a puddle in one of these caves that he discovers. He's literally fighting and scrapping and clawing for everything and anything that he can get. Trying to satisfy those basic safety needs are probably the first couple of things that Chuck has to deal with, and it's definitely a struggle. Now, the second security need that Chuck struggles with is connection. Obviously, he's alone on the island. He doesn't have anyone to talk to or bounce ideas off of. And there is this feeling of aloneness that really permeates the movie. If you listen to the movie, if you get your hands on the DVD or the Blu-ray, and you listen to the director's commentary, they talk about the sound design a little bit in the movie. And for most of the movie, especially when Chuck is on the island, there's no musical score. And they did this on purpose because they wanted the audience to 
feel what Chuck was feeling, at least when he's on the island. If you play the dramatic score, or if you play the depressing score, or if you play the action score, then it might influence the way the audience feels. But if you just play nothing, you kind of get more into the role that Chuck is feeling on that island. Now, the third and final security need that Chuck struggles with is self-esteem. We learn later in the movie that Chuck at least thought about suicide, didn't necessarily go through with the attempt. And I think it's important to note that self-esteem, as defined by Scott Barry Kaufman at least, is basically the feeling that you have that you are in control of your environment. So it's the extent that you feel like you matter and that you are contributing to the way things are unfolding around you. To me, at least, there's no doubt that early on during his time on the island, Chuck is really struggling to feel like he's impacting the world and not just having the world happen to him. Again, he can't seem to do anything right. But strangely enough, out of that failure and out of that frustration, Wilson is born. Chuck starts opening up the FedEx packages that start washing up on the island. One of them is a volleyball, and as he's trying to make fire, he cuts his hand. Screaming in frustration, he grabs the volleyball and throws it against the wall, only to later on realize that he's made this handprint on the ball, and he kind of does some artistic, fancy footwork, and the face of Wilson is born. I think there's some interesting symbolic resonance there that Wilson is made up of Chuck's blood. At any rate, as Chuck is opening up these packages and using whatever's inside of them to try to help his survival chances on the island, whether it's the blades from the ice skates or the film from the VHS tapes. Hopefully you're old enough to know what a VHS tape is. But he eventually discovers one of Bettina's packages. Bettina, of course, from earlier in the movie, the person who was putting the angel wings on the packages, and Chuck decides not to open this one. He puts the package aside, and it's something that we continue to think about and we continue to see over and over as the movie progresses, but it's never really explicitly mentioned by Chuck why he's keeping this package around. Shortly after this, Chuck sees a boat, and he makes sort of a half-assed attempt to escape the island. He gets on his yellow floaty thing, and he starts paddling out past the reef and the waves, but he ends up getting crushed by the ocean, he takes a massive injury to his leg, and obviously he's pretty depressed about all of this. Now, from the perspective of humanistic psychology, you could argue that that first attempt at escape doesn't work because he doesn't have his security needs that we just went over in place yet, and he certainly doesn't have the higher level growth needs in place yet either exploration and love and purpose. On a more practical level, you could just say he needs a sail before he can get past that barrier of the coral reefs and the waves. But on a symbolic level, maybe that prison of the reef and the waves that are keeping him on the island are symbolic and representative of him needing to fulfill his humanistic needs before he's ready to leave the island. So Chuck takes that vicious injury while he's trying to escape the island. He's sitting there staring at the ocean, which is just everywhere in this movie, representing the unknown and the vicious way of nature and of life. And it echoes the crossroads at the beginning of the movie and at the end of the movie. He's at a point here where he has to decide what he's going to do. Time isn't going to help him. It has now stood still for him. Nobody is coming to save him. And he has to determine what it is that makes him 
who he is and what it is that's going to allow him to find the strength to continue. He only has himself now. He's going to be the only one writing the rest of his story. So how does he want it to end? This moment in Castaway always reminds me of one of my favorite scenes in the A Song of Ice and Fire books where Jamie Lannister faces a similar crossroads and a similar blank slate that he has to decide how he wants the rest of his life to play out in. In Jamie's case, he kind of lived his whole life as a villain and almost playing a role as a character that he felt like he had to play. But at a certain point in the books, he starts going through this character transformation where he wants to decide how his story plays out. And maybe he wants to start over on a path of honor. As a member of the King's Guard that in the Game of Thrones books guards the King of Westeros, the Lord Commander of that group writes a book that has information on the lives of the other King's Guard members. So Jamie has this great moment when he becomes the Lord Commander himself, where he realizes that nobody else is going to write his story for him. From here on out, he has a blank slate, and he's going to write his own story. We're already 25 minutes into Castaway here, so why the hell not pull A Storm of Swords off the bookshelf? Quote, When he was done, more than three quarters of his page still remained to be filled, between the gold lion on the crimson shield on top and the blank white shield at the bottom. Sir Gerald Hightower had begun his history, and Sir Barristan Selmy had continued it, but the rest, Jamie Lannister would need to write for himself. He could write whatever he chose, henceforth. Whatever he chose. End quote. In the same way that Jamie in the story is powerfully at that crossroads in life, Chuck on the island in Castaway is at a similar crossroads. And one of the things that he's doing on the island is he's cementing his purpose, as the Japanese would call it, his ikigai, his reason for being. At first glance, that ikigai, that purpose, is getting back to Kelly. He's drawing pictures of her on the wall. He's looking at the locket that has her picture in it. At various points throughout his time on the island or on the raft, he's mentioning her name out loud. So Kelly is seemingly playing a big role in his purpose of trying to get off the island. But you also have this box and the role that Bettina plays in Chuck's life unknowingly. Looking at that package, looking at those wings, and wanting to deliver that last package helps Chuck to find meaning and purpose and ikigai and love and exploration on the island. It helps him to get in touch with his, not just those security, those basic needs, but more of the growth and the creative needs, exploration and love and purpose. And the way he discovers the wings on the box and the impetus and the drive that that gives him spurs him to start creating fire and sort of getting things more in order on the island. Of course, there's the great I have made fire speech that Tom Hanks delivers amazingly. I think you have to keep in mind that this is a acting tour de force by Tom Hanks, in my opinion. He's literally carrying an entire movie single-handedly for at least 90 minutes. Now, Tom Hanks has gotten a lot of accolades over the years, but from an award perspective, not so much for this movie. And really, Castaway as a whole was ignored by the award shows. That being said, I don't really care about the Academy Awards, and for the most part, their picks are nonsense anyway, but Sometimes it's funny to go back 20 years and look at the list of nominations for that year and then see which movies have held up and stood up against the test of time and which ones haven't. So let's see which movies Castaway lost out to wasn't even nominated that year for the Academy Awards. We have Gladiator. We have Chocolat. 
Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Aaron Brockovich, and Traffic. Listen, I like Gladiator as much as the next guy, but yikes. If you listen to the director commentary of the movie, the director kind of talks about how Castaway never really tested well when they did sort of like the focus groups that a lot of big time movies will do to see if the audience will like it or not. It never tested well. A lot of people didn't really understand the movie. What do you mean? It's just one person on an island for the whole movie? How do you make a movie out of that? What's the story? Once the movie came out, I think a lot of people got hung up on the Wilson thing. And instead of analyzing what to me is just a incredibly deep and moving film, the discussion around it just kind of became this series of memes about Wilson. And the rest of the movie got dismissed in some sense. Anyway, I'm ranting a little bit here about things that don't really matter, but back to the story, Chuck is now discovering and fulfilling what humanistic psychologist Scott Barry Kaufman would describe as growth needs. Exploration, which means making sense of the uncertain and seeking out the uncertain in order to grow. Love, which I think we all know what love means, and purpose, finding meaning in life. As far as exploration goes, Chuck begins accepting that this is not going to be a short stay on this island. Making a help sign in the sand with his feet is not going to be helpful in the long run. He's going to have to learn to survive. He's going to have to learn to find some way to make his life on the island meaningful. He begins to learn his creative side. He can do cave paintings. He can do some drawings. He gets creative with building this raft. He's keeping in mind his love for Kelly and his larger purpose of returning to the world. He leaves his mark on the island. There's a scene where he literally does leave his mark on the island, writing that inscription on the wall of a rock, saying, Chuck Nolan was here 1,500 days. Escape to sea. Tell Kelly Frears, Memphis, Tennessee, I love her. When that sail washes up on the beach, he paints the wings on it, the wings from Bettina's box. And you're left wondering, what do they symbolize to Chuck? And so, with all of his humanistic psychological needs on the way to being fulfilled, or at least being addressed, whether it's safety or connection or self-esteem, exploration and love and purpose, He's now ready to sail. He's now ready to get off the island, and he's now ready to fulfill his potential. He makes the decision that mere survival on the island is not enough for him. He could probably do it for the rest of his life, but he wants to risk it for a chance to really live. As he's leaving the island and he finally makes it past the reef and the waves thanks to the sail, there's this very poignant moment in the movie where the sad theme song kicks in and Chuck is sitting on the raft looking back at the island and you start to feel some of the things that Chuck might be feeling. On the one hand, he's probably happy that his contraption worked to get him off the island. But on the other hand, here he is starting over again. Just like he had to start over on the island and rebuild himself and determine what he was going to take with him from the past to help him build himself up on the island, now he has to start over all over again. And the journey to get back to civilization, and once he's back in civilization, rebuilding himself again, is going to be maybe just as difficult as surviving on the island was. Shortly after this, Chuck loses Wilson in what is probably the most enduring scene of the movie. And he eventually gets picked up by a passing boat with the only thing left from his time on the island being Bettina's package that he still has to deliver. When he gets back to civilization, he meets up with Stan 
who greets him and Chuck apologizes for not being there for Stan when Stan's wife was sick. He realizes that he was too absorbed with work and time and schedules rather than being there for his friend. They talk about Chuck's funeral and Chuck seems to be interested in the fact that they had a funeral and he wants to know what did they put in the coffin. If he wasn't there, he was on the island, what did they put in the coffin? And Stan tells him a cell phone, a beeper, some pictures, and a few Elvis CDs. That was it. That was his life. And it's great acting because Tom Hanks doesn't have to say it as Chuck, but you can just see it on his face. How do you summarize a life? Is that what he wants to be when his life is over? A couple of pictures, a couple of CDs, and a beeper? What makes you who you are? What would you want to have in that coffin that would summarize you? Can you summarize a life, or can you only experience it, live it, and appreciate it day by day? You can see and feel Chuck going through this thought process as he's looking at the plates of food and the crab legs, and he's playing with the lighter, and he's just looking at all of the things back in civilization that four years ago he took for granted. But out on that island, when he was scrapping and clawing and fighting for every inch of his life, something as simple as eating a crab leg was life or death. Eventually, Chuck meets up with Kelly, and there's the amazing scene where they're doing the smooching in the rain, and Chuck goes in reverse with the car. But at the end of the day, Kelly has to go home to her family because she's been remarried and she has kids. She moved on without Chuck, and it's over. That's one of the things I like about this movie is that in a cheesy rom-com, they would get back together and that would be the end of the movie. But in real life, things move on. People change. Time goes on. So time and moving on and letting go is not just a theme for Chuck out on the island. It's also a theme for everybody else in the world in the story. And that's the way reality is, at least from my perspective. In the famous monologue at the end of the movie, Chuck talks about this feeling of letting go and moving on yet also holding on to something, realizing that letting go might be important and loss might be necessary, but it doesn't have to define you. He says, talking about what it was, the feeling it was on the island that allowed him to continue to endure. Quote, I had power over nothing, and that's when this feeling came over me like a warm blanket. I knew somehow that I had to stay alive. Somehow. I had to keep breathing. Even though there was no reason to hope. And all my logic said that I would never see this place again. So that's what I did. I stayed alive. I kept breathing. And one day my logic was proven all wrong because the tide came in and gave me a sail. And now, here I am. I'm back, in Memphis, talking to you. I have ice in my glass and I've lost her all over again. I'm so sad that I don't have Kelly, but I'm so grateful that she was with me on that island, and I know what I have to do now. I have to keep breathing, because tomorrow the sun will rise. Who knows what the tide could bring? End quote. At the end of the movie, he delivers the package to the now single Bettina, writing in his note that it saved his life, and maybe it was his ikigai, maybe it was his purpose. He goes back to the crossroads that we see at the beginning of the movie, and like we said earlier, things have now come full circle with Chuck at the crossroads. But it's interesting to note, if you look at the crossroads at the beginning of the movie, it's brown, it's in the winter, and yet at the end of the movie, it's summer, things are more green, and there's some symbolism in the way that the environment looks. By seemingly random chance, Bettina drives up next to him, they have a conversation, and she gives him some directions on where he is. As she's driving away, 
Chuck looks back and sees the same wings that were on the package on her truck. And maybe he realizes that there might be something more going on here. There's a bit of a subtle irony that when Chuck was on the island, Bettina was unknowingly giving him purpose and direction. And in the final scene of the movie, she's literally giving him direction. And at the end of the movie, Chuck now seems to understand. So at the end of the movie, it ends a little bit ambiguously and vaguely at the crossroads with Chuck standing in the middle of it. Just like when he was leaving the island, he's now ready to sail into the unknown. But we now know he has the tools to navigate and transcend and deal with whatever comes his way. The final shot of the movie is Chuck looking back towards Bettina, and even though he's at that crossroads and it is left ambiguous, I think we all know where he's going. Despite all the times over the course of the movie that circumstances and the environment around him transpired to destroy him, and despite all the times his identity and his meaning and his love got crushed. Throughout the movie, he's able to hold on to something deep about who he is and what life is all about, and that allows him to rebuild his life. And maybe what he learns is that no matter how isolated or how alone or how down you are, there's always someone out there, even if you don't know it yet, even if you can't see them, that can help you get through whatever you're facing. <laughs> 